as the provider of data for AI services, you don't always know what the end use is going to be for your customer. Washington DC at the highest concentration of translation interpreting jobs. So that's 1.23 per 1,000 jobs. We don't grow in terms of an M&A path. That's not our gig. We grow by the quality of our service and the quality of the relationships. And welcome to Slater Pod 72. Hello. Hi, Florian. How's it going over there in London? Pretty good. Yeah. It, things are on the up. <laughs> Things are in the up. That's what they are here as well. Today, we're not heading up. We're heading west to Ireland. So we're going to talk to Thomas Murray, the CEO of Vistatech. Mm. And Vistatech, obviously, a lot of people know them. They're one of the leading providers of uh, enterprise localization. Uh, we'll discuss kind of how this business evolved from like, you know, the big software launches of the, I don't know, what do you call this? The the noughties, the O, the OEs? Yeah, the noughties. The noughties, okay. I think that's an accepted uh, term. Great to, you know, now obviously a lot more agile and uh, and all of that. So, yeah, last week we had Slitacon Remote. Fantastic. On Thursday, four hours, probably even more than four hours. Um, and, yeah, we had, I think, over 300 people attending. Mm. There was a lot of interaction. I actually, I was going to look up the stats, but I think it facilitated like 200 to 300 networking sessions, like these individual networking sessions, which are pretty cool. I actually met someone that I'm going to follow up on, uh, on a particular project. So mm, very nice. it's cool. You know, it's, the, um, and you did it too, right? It's basically that kind of random yeah, yeah. chat the speed, thing. Speed networking. The speed networking. Yeah. And it's getting a little better. I think there's uh you can, yeah, it's getting better in terms of, I think we could actually manipulate it on the back end. We could like say, well, these groups can only network with these groups, but we, oh, and, and okay. you can really, well, yeah. I mean, if you, you know, Hopman's kind of built for like uh, 10,000 people plus, et cetera. So you can yeah. kind of tweak this, but you know, for, for our purposes, we didn't, we didn't, we just let the algorithm determine. Well, and uh, you can also request to, to speak to, to somebody directly. I, I can, hadn't realized right. that, but yeah, you can also do that. Well, you may have not realized it, or it just wasn't a function. I mean, they keep adding a lot of new stuff. And then we had the booths, um, which were, I think we had like seven or eight booths, uh, which people could stop by. And people did stop by. That was uh, that was interesting. And then there was the Lilt session in between, uh, which was also cool. We had about 80 people on that session that was in, in the break. So, um, yeah, someone won the AirPods. Right. Yeah, I I know the person that that won them. I you don't know, the know if it was just, well, I don't know if it was just one set of AirPods that they were giving away, maybe. But in any case, I know somebody who uh, won the Lilt AirPods who was very very happy about it. So there you go. Yeah. You need AirPods, Esther. I know. I know. <laughs> Although I need I, mine. Are, I, mine are actually broken. Uh, they they don't have the. Um, I mean, they work, but they don't have the, what do you call it? The noise cancellation okay. thing is yeah. if I activate it, there's kind of a, a weird static sound. So mm -hmm. I don't have the noise cancellation anymore. But because I never travel, I don't really use the noise cancellation anymore. Well, that much. I don't travel either, but I definitely need the noise cancellation being in central London. True, true. No, I don't need it here. Well, I mean, they, they keep building out there. They keep ripping up the tram um tracks and uh, uh, so on so it's yeah it's pretty noisy that's why we're recording this over lunch time so it's a little less noisy uh, you know the workers are having lunch um cool so uh, just quick key takeaways what was um what was your key takeaway let's start with Ayuno. yeah uh, well from so from slatecon remote we had David yep. Lee, the CEO of I, you know, um, yeah, I mean, it was a great message of, of growth really within, within that industry, sort of longer term trends, sectoral trends towards growth with, um, over the top streaming services. He gave some stats as well, talking about 200, well, more than 200 million new, um, what's it? SVOD subscription video on demand, uh, accounts being created in 2020. Sounds like a lot and more than 500 million net global video on demand subscribers now mm. around the world. Huge. Um, he was talking a little bit about scale and speed, the necessity for, for both of those elements in this new uh, streaming reality. Yeah, so that, I, that, I, like, I liked also, it, yeah. Yeah, there was a question from the audience around, mm. like, is the, the production restarting? And he said, look, uh, 
the, the demand, I think it says, yes, yes, it's restarting. But mm. also, I mean, the demand for the back catalog is still there because all these new players, you know, the Apples and what have you mm. are, are aggressively pushing in. And there's just so much more to, to back, I mean, to, to localize from, from back catalog. Yeah, um, exactly. Why wouldn't you the, if you've got a whole back catalog yeah. of, of great content that you can access? I think Disney isn't done yet. It's so random. Certain Disney, good mm. Disney, like cartoons, like the longer, I mean, the two hour, whatever, one and a half hour kit cartoons, like some of them are, for some random reason, they only show in Italian and English for me. So oh, okay. <laughs> for my kids, I'm like, well, you know, you, should we watch it in Italian or English? And then like they, well, they don't, they don't like, uh, obviously they want to then I watch it in German, <laughs> but then, yeah. well, neither. But then the thing is we switch to English, which is, uh, you know, obviously a little closer than, than Italian. Mm. And then, but then the background, some of the, well, not, not subtitles, but actually some of the text inside the movie is yeah. localized into Italian. Oh, I see. Like okay. some, of, some of the writing, like, so this like emergency in Italian or like, you know, yeah. click here would be in Italian. And, right. and it's actually, okay. it looks quite, uh, quite well done. That was, I should have asked uh, at some point. Like, how, well, but hang how, on, aren't you saying they're mixing it? languages though? When you're saying it's They like, are, yes. Okay, so, it's, so that's the, not great. Well, that's not great. So well, <laughs> generally that, that, that's where Disney probably needs to work a little bit more uh, on because I'm sure they have other versions other than Italian and English. So it's a little mm -hmm. random that I only get to choose Italian and English. Anyway, rambling, uh, moving on, yeah. data for AI. Yeah, data for AI. That was a really great panel session that uh, Anna moderated. It was, we had Casper Grathwell, who we've also had on the podcast from yeah. the president of Oxford Languages Division at Oxford University Press. We also had Cara Lindell, the CEO of Veninger Global and Michelle Lopez, uh, the founder and CEO of E. To F. So, I mean, there are a few things I think that stood out for me in this. One was sort of comparing the similarities and differences of servicing data for AI customers versus LS or traditional language services customers. Uh, one big thing that came out was recruitment and the difference in sourcing requirements, hmm. really. So with an LSP, they were saying, you know, with your linguists, with your translators, you want to build this longer term almost partnership style relationship. You have linguists that are working on the same customer, account, customer accounts again and again and again for years sometimes, whereas data for AI projects tend to be way more ad hoc, very project-based. So I think Michelle was saying, once you've built your data sets, uh, you're, you may never contact those same people ever again. So it's kind of one off, move on to the next thing. Um, yeah. And I think a wider point as well was generally that um, as the as the provider of data for AI services, you don't always know what the end use is going to be for your customer because it might be really sensitive. It's a very fast moving, you know, potential uh, confidentiality issues and, and all sorts happening around that space. So I think Casper was saying, well, it, it can be quite challenging to see what the big picture is and what your client is actually trying to achieve with the project that they've asked you to complete and that their needs might, change throughout the duration of the project interesting yeah mm -hmm. I, it's yeah it's basically a giant recruitment exercise it mm. seems often mm. right and project based uh i think that's what also some of the app and investors maybe found out uh you know that this isn't i mean that it's still a service business because mm -hmm. we spoke about the story with app and it, the stock tank etc uh, so it's it's a it's uh it's very much a recruiting business which obviously is Good for, for LSPs because they know how to recruit. Um, mm. uh, e-commerce. We had an e-commerce panel with yes. uh, not Spotify, but Shopify <laughs> and, uh, and Blend and uh, Wix. So Yes. Yeah. So I was moderating this one and we had Liat from Wix, who was their head of e-commerce marketing. We had Julia Greco from Shopify, who's the localization programs lead for one of their localized, one of their three localization teams. And we had Yaya Tal from Blend. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was good again, sort of a rosy picture of e-commerce and we delved into some of the some of the opportunities and some of the challenges that 2020 brought to the sector. Everybody was saying, okay, it was a transformative year for e-commerce. You had, on the one hand, consumers' expectations were shifting uh, with the move to online and 
nobody being allowed out. And then also you had these new realities and some new opportunities for merchants. So we we, sh- we spoke quite a bit about cr- the opportunities of cross-border trade and how localization um, facilitates that. So growth all around, both at Shopify at, and Wix and, and the merchants and businesses that they, that they facilitate. Um, so I think Liat from Wix was telling us that the... Um, they had something like 63% more stores had shoppers coming from multiple countries in 2020. Um, and Julia gave us a bit of a story about how um, how they were helping, how Shopify was helping some of their um, some of their uh, stores as well to pivot online. Um, you know, for example, doing providing gift vouchers, and they were fast tracking some of these initiatives that they'd already started, but to help people during during the pandemic. Um, and Julia also was talking about you know, the decentralized model that they run at Shopify, talking about some of the differences between her team, which is marketing growth and uh, with compared to the product team that does the back end and also the support team um, from the localization perspective. Um, yeah. It was good. It was takeaways? good. Yeah. Let, good takeaway. So let me just go through uh, a couple others. Uh, Corn Ferry, and just briefly, because we want to talk about... Uh, some of the other stories we picked mm-hmm. up this week. But uh, so Corn Ferry, Valérie Petit uh, spoke, gave a presentation um, uh, on transitioning from print to digital. So she works for, I mean, Corn Ferry is kind of a management consultant, HR uh, mm. ma- management firm, right? And they have a lot of these also testing, uh, the testing content. So we spoke a bit about the challenges for translating some of the testing material which uh, just from a language point of view are, are really difficult to do. And, and she, you know, gave an example from, well, like we're, we're some Russian uh, uh, staff internally, like we're just debating uh, the, the translation of certain terms for, for, for a long time. So it just mm. kind of highlights sometimes it's not only about text. Often, always, of course, it's it's around just the difficulty of, of getting the, the actual translation right, right? No matter what technology you have. Mm. Um, and then we had ADP, uh, Marianne Henselman, and that was really nice. I liked that she had only basically one slide, but just it, it basically it was a journey, right? And one slide started in, uh, when did it start? In 2008, took over like a very nascent kind of internal localization department all the way to 2021 now and beyond and how they kind of deliberately build up that internal localization and translation capability. ADP is huge. I think they process like, I don't know, she she mentioned a number I, f- I forgot, but like a mm. big chunk of global payroll. Um, oh, wow. Okay. And they have like 800,000 clients, $14 billion revenue. So there's, there's a lot of obviously translation localization going. And then she mm. mentioned one thing that I remember was that she got internal competition on MT. So they were working around and doing some NT, but then there was somebody internally somewhere in Europe that started basically developing a proprietary NMT engine. And then some of the senior managers were coming, hey, like what's going on here? Like, can you do this as well? And then, so there was internal competition from, not from the lock function, but basically from outside. And and then they, um, well, they more aggressively pursued NMT and now they're actually reporting to the CTO. So it was a, it was an Very interesting good. story there. Mm. Um, talking about tech, we had Dell, Dell's Wayne Borland, uh, director of translation. He spoke to, we localize uh, Daring Gobble, VP of solutions, kind of working around, uh, you know, just using data uh, in uh, to uh, for, for localization and uh, calculating ROI and just also how hard it is to get sometimes the data from I don't know what you call it, but the field, like the the non-localization functions, and and to really uh, get that right uh, for okay. you know automation, etc. Um, hard to summarize. Sorry, uh, I butchered this a little bit. And just uh, <laughs> it a was few a really words, great one. This I think it was one it was of my favorite one. sessions. Yeah. Sessions actually, the two of them sort of talking together yeah. about their partnership and their solutions. That's what I, the feedback I also got from a couple of people. They were like, "Hey, I really like the." Uh, conversational format so mm. we had some presentations but we also had some conversational um you know it's not even presentations; it was just conversations so yeah i think that that lightens it up because uh, you know it's it is it is hard to sit in front of your screen for four and a half hours so you mm. want to uh you want to break up uh, uh you want to break it up a little bit okay hard turn to the UK <laughs> and what five hundred million dollars in contracts for healthcare, but that's that's not all of it is for the NHS, right? There's some. There's it's some not. Other... It's not only NHS, but it, they're both yeah. healthcare. So one 
it was two across two different tenders and it was i mean in theory more than half a billion us dollars but these are framework contracts so mm. we it tends to be more of a ceiling than an actual guaranteed value um but yeah this was two two different tenders in the uk for the public sector translation and interpreting services that were awarded pretty recently one was for healthcare trust europe i don't know about europe <laughs> <laughs> given that we're in the UK, but sure. Okay, thanks, uh, Healthcare Trust You're Europe. Europe. You're Europe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, The yeah. UK is in Europe. I like when the UK keep, like says, like, it's the UK and then Europe. Like, Well, people keep excluding us from data points, like the UK excluding Europe. So, you know, it's hard, it's hard to sort of picture it. But anyway, the point is, there were some awards from a body called Healthcare Trust Europe. And I should not have... Uh, brought up the Europe question then um we can so talk was... Europe all day we can talk Europe we're not part <laughs> we of have... Europe we're in the middle yeah we're not part okay. of it <laughs> sorry go ahead we digress so yeah this healthcare trust Europe let's call it HTE um was allocated allocated 250 million pounds to lots of different or well, several different LSPs and then there was also a separate tender from the NHS shared business services that allocated 125 million GBP to also lots of different people. Vendors. So mm -hmm. uh, what was the duration again? It was like three years, some of them. Three years, all right. Yeah. So I remember when, when we got started with Slater in 2015, 2016, and we first mm. came across these contracts, like my mind was blown. Like, what? Like you're talking about 100 million mm. pounds and... And now, I'm, I mean, you know, I'm, I've gotten used to it and it, the contracts are getting bigger and bigger. But I think it's just that the UK is one of the very few countries globally that aggregates all of this nationwide. Yeah. That's the, why the numbers the most are so part, big. I mean, they, they do, yeah, they do also have some, I think, regional procurement and particularly when it comes to interpreting. Um, like there was the Eastern but, Shires one and there's yeah. a few... There are, like there this. are, there are still regional ones, but you're, you're right that I think it compared certainly to some of, some of the other European countries were certainly more centralized. Oh, much more. I mean, yeah. there's no, I mean, in Switzerland, there's no federal centralization yeah. of, and in the world, like Switzerland is obviously 10 times smaller in, in terms of population or like mm. maybe eight times. Well, we're a so, relatively small country geographically, so maybe that has something to do with it as well. Well, I think you just, I think you're, the, the, the British central government is quite efficient and centralized. I mean, that mm -hmm. what we've seen with the, uh, well, trust <laughs> it's me. All I mean, also, yeah, it's all relative, I guess. Yeah. When I'm, when I'm using the, the government websites and all of that, it, yeah. like, you know. Oh, it, the websites are really good. Yeah. UK government really, websites, really good. digital, they're pretty, hot, they're pretty, yeah. For, I think forward thinking, quite advanced when it comes to digital. Yes. So, yeah, but okay, I mean, like when you surf our good. federal government's website, there's still uh, like PDFs and like, okay. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so, well, how much do, what, what do you think is the average wage, or the median, sorry, the median annual pay for somebody employed in the translation localization industry in the US annually? Not transit interpreters, but actually somebody employed in the industry in the US. What do you think? Uh, well, I kind of remember, I remember the figure from last year it was around sort of 50, 50,000 or something. That's right. 52,000, uh, $330 as of May, 2020, uh, it's up slightly from 51,830 in 2019. And, and this is data is coming from the Bureau of Labor Statistics annual occupational outlook handbook, uh, tracks mm -hmm. employment wage estimates for over 800 occupations was released on March 31st. We covered it now. Actually, the, the category uh, translation interpretation uh, covers 77,000 um, employees in the US, not freelancers and independent contractors. So mm. this is not counting freelance linguists. So it's, but it also includes more than just linguists, right? It's people employed in this industry. So anybody who works for, you know, probably TransPerfect Linebridge would be included there if they're working in the oh, US. Okay. Yeah. So it's not, just for for translators and interpreters. Mm. Uh, now, in terms of the top paying states, it was Virginia, New Jersey, Maryland, New York, and California, um, mm -hmm. somewhere between 70 and almost $80,000 a year median. 
Um, and then Washington DC at the highest concentration of um, translation interpreting jobs. So hang on, that's 1.23 per 1,000 jobs. So that's that's like one in every thousand would be in that industry. That's fascinating. 12 uh, in every 10,000, yeah. I mean, it's We don't know how many the, jobs there were. Well, how many jobs no, there were? No, but it's <laughs> because of all the government <laughs> contractors, right? Mm. So it's all the, probably all of the defense contractors are based there. And, and, mm. uh, and so, you know close to the center of power. So I, that, that would be my speculation. Um, mm -hmm. And generally, they're very optimistic. They also, like like we are, right? We just posted business is booming for, mm -hmm. as, as our rep for Slatacon Remote. But uh, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics says they're expecting a 20% increase in jobs by 2029. So about 15,000 additional jobs in this industry. Again, that's not counting freelancers. So mm. bullishness all around. And they say job prospects should be best for those who have professional certification. Now you tell me what the professional certification is, but uh, maybe an ATA certificate would help. Cool. All right. Well, that's it for now. Let's head over and talk to Thomas Murray of Vistatech. Sounds good. And welcome back to Slater Pod. Today with Thomas Murray, the CEO of Vistatech. Hi, Thomas. Hi, Florian. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Not too bad at all. Not too bad at all. Glad to be here. Great. Thank, thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, Thomas, wh where does this podcast find you today? What city, what country? Well, I'm at home here in Dublin, COVID bound, I think, like most people at this stage, and uh, hopefully looking forward to some relief um, in the next few months with a bit of luck. Yeah. Absolutely. So in, in Ireland, how are things going? Are you improving uh, slowly, slowly opening up or improving yeah. slowly? The vaccine rollout has really started to accelerate here and that's really starting to have an impact. And um, we would be hopeful to be close enough to normality, possibly by July, August. But international travel is probably a ways off for us yet, I would have thought. Um, but in terms of day to day living, we would hope to be getting back to some level of normality um, by the end of July, which would be great. Nice. We've, yeah, had, a, yeah. we've had a long lockdown here, pretty much on and off since March of last year, really. Um, I can so relate. It's been tough, I can relate yeah. in, the, in London. <laughs> mm. Yes, yes. Well, you guys are, on the, are nearly yeah. out, I believe, um, yeah. which must be great. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, so we're, uh, Esther and I were talking offline uh, a couple of days ago about maybe doing something in Zurich towards the end of the year in terms of conferencing. So, uh, you know, l let's see. I mentioned a couple yeah. of times I don't want to be blazing the trail in terms of in-person conference, but I am uh, I am missing uh, the in-person element here. I think so. I think everybody is missing, you know, that an element of human contact in their lives. Certainly those of us that had, you know, a high level of contact, perhaps in office-based scenarios. Yeah, it is. It's a very different uh, set up for us. Um, but that being said, I still think, you know, we need to be careful and, you know, adhere to the public health guidelines and, you know, keep each, keep each other safe. So, you know, for the moment, I think um, we'll be taking a very long view in terms of travel and um, particularly mm. business travel. Um, I just don't feel comfortable that I would want to put any of my people, our customers at risk for the foreseeable. You know, I think we're just going to have to take yeah. a, a long, hard look at it before we start changing our, our, our views on that. Makes sense. Makes sense. So, Thomas, tell us a bit more about your personal background, career, and, and what made you uh, land in the language industry. Has this been something for your whole career life or <laughs> uh, is this more of a – usually people get into this okay. by kind of happenstance coincidence. It's that's, – that's certainly true for myself. My background would be finance. And I had been working in London and in Australia when I was just after I'd finished university. And a friend of mine mentioned an opportunity in a localization company. This has gone back many, many years. And I went out to have a look and it just seemed like a really exciting place to work. The place was full of like minded people. It was, you know, a hive of activity and excitement. And there was just a buzz about it. And it was really a great place to work and the people were amazing. And that started whenever over 20, 25 years ago now, and it hasn't changed for me. So I suppose it probably was happenstance, but it was the people and the environment that, that, that attracted me to it and um, no regrets, absolutely no regrets since. 
And so that was in That's Dublin. And then we moved on from there. I spent a little bit of time in Asia um, and then came back to Vistatech. So and no plans to leave the industry at the moment anyway. Great. Yeah, we. I have very few people have had regrets about joining the industry. So from the many people I've I've spoken to so far. So well, it's certainly an exciting um, place to be. There's no doubt about it that. It is. It is. Absolutely. So you you mentioned Vistatech. Of course, of course, you're the CEO. G- give us Vistatech in a nutshell. Uh, Present size, staff, specializations. Well, I suppose Vistatech is is. Um, how would you describe Vistatech? Well, for me, Vistatech is a passion, okay, as an organization. And I would say this, I believe it's staffed by some of the best people in the industry. It's a great place to work. You know, that for me is is absolutely critical. You know, I, I feel very strongly that people need to be coming to work, looking forward to it and enjoying it. Because if you don't, you know, there are, it, it's, it's just not worth it. So that is really important to me. Vistatech as an organization and as a business, um, you know, this industry started, I suppose, in, 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 a, in a very conventional sense of translation, you know, but over time, certainly we have transitioned to a point where I would say, you know, conventional or orthodox translation is probably at this point less than a third of our business. And we would now very much see ourselves as in the in a position of providing, you know, global content solutions for, for organizations that, you know, play on a global stage. And that can cover, you know, anything, you know, from text to voice to video, like you name it, you know, I think it's, it's, one of the interesting things about our industry is how many times it reinvents itself and surprises you. Um, you know, back in the day, I remember, you know, it was all doc and content came from software publishers. And, you know, that's just the way it was. Whereas now, you know, the, the, the number of ways you can consume content, and that's before we even consider, you know, the volumes of content out there is astronomical. So we would see, you know, ourselves as providing, you know, global content solutions to anybody that wants to play in a global stage. And, you know, it's it's critical, you know, for the global players to, to maintain that global presence. And that's what we're there. That's what we're there to facilitate and help. And what's it like servicing? That's yeah. also in a nutshell. As a nutshell, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, what's it like servicing this global stage from Dublin, Ireland? Ireland. I mean, can you tell us a bit about what business life is like in Dublin with tech businesses? Well, certainly Dublin has had a reputation um, for for um, being quite a hotbed of technology, mm-hmm. um, and it has certainly attracted you know all of the major names to Dublin, and that has kind of led to quite a kind of a hothouse environment here in Dublin with all of the various tech companies, which is which is great. Um, but for us. You know, the location, you know, was really born, I suppose, of the founders of the company. You know, they were all Irish and were based here in Dublin, and that's where we've remained. But as a business, we'd have, you know, locations and resources basically all over the world, wherever the, the, the clients or the services demand. Um, but, you know, from a personal point of view, I suppose, how do I see it? Well, for me, it's very easy. I just kind of basically set the tone and the tenor for the business, hire the right people, and then make sure I stay out of the way and let them, you know, do what their expertise has trained them to do so you know the being based here in dublin has you know really it's more happenstance it has no particular impact on the business we have operations and people you know wherever mm. we need them and um, it, it does remain the case that a, you know the, a large majority of um you know the tech clients which we would perhaps deal with are based out of the us but um less so we would have more and more european and asian based clients and um, so you know from that point of view wherever we're based really doesn't matter mm. a whole lot and certainly you know the 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 shift um the paradigm shift that COVID has brought around you know has certainly been made, made very clear to, to to all of us that you know geos are from from our side of the fence really not that important yeah in terms of it's, it's interesting you say that i mean and you brought up mountain view there so you've got i think a fairly large offices in mm. in mountain view and is that sort of a yep does that facilitate yep. 24 hour service etc how do you collaborate with them yep well we have to have people basically follow the sun at this stage if we're not in a position to provide 24 7 365 well then you know you're not in a position to help your clients achieve their goals you know ultimately your clients goals you know are what you're there to help achieve 
and they are driven by consumers and you know consumers demands are are um very 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 strong and in some cases quite fickle so if you know if you don't satisfy those demands and you know your consumers will move so we have to be in a position to service that so be it you know argentina mountain view god knows where and um, we have to be in a position to deal mm. with that you know mm. that's that's the nature of the game really yeah. you know Let's the, the turnaround a... times and so... pardon go ahead sir i was just saying you know that the 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 turnaround times that 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 projects now demand um are so you know so tight you know that that any any kind of distance between you and your customer or you and your supply chain you know is critical mm -hmm. so you know having that that geo spread is 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 critical it's 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 vital really for us got it so maybe let's take a bit of a macro uh, view here so you've been in the industry for for quite some time as well mm -hmm. and uh what changes have you seen uh, generally, like in the translation localization? What, what would be yeah. like the top three things over the past one or two decades, right? The volume has got to be top of the list. You know, the sheer mm. volume of content, you know, that is out there um, is, is the biggest one. You know, like, nobody would ever have forecasted and the industry is full of people who thought they were going to be able to, but it just exceeds expectations um, every time. You know, people thought, you know, that MT would, you know, would, would eat our lunch and that would be the end. But you know, it's it's hard to imagine. But actually, the growth of content has has actually outstripped the pace at which MT can deal with it. Um, so for me, you know, content would you know the growth or the content explosion would certainly be in the top three. Um, I think um, perhaps you know from my perspective or, or on my generation's perspective, the way in which data or, or content is consumed and you know is is has changed utterly. You know, it was it was largely, you know, the 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 province of business and, you know, big, large tech manuals and all that kind of stuff. That's all gone now. You know, now it's the consumer that drives it. The content is created, you know, by people walking down the street outside my my office here um, on, you know, handheld devices, things that, you know, people thought were, you know, science fiction, you know, 20 years ago. So, you know, that would probably be another massive change for us. And also, I think, you know, how important content actually is and how content can change things and drive things um, and impact people all over the world in ways that we would never have envisaged. Um, you know, I think that, that, that that's probably another aspect that has, has, has really kind of, you know, hit me over the years in terms of globalization. And um, the, the one that always kind of makes me think is, 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 you know, Uber, you know, Uber was thought up, I believe here in Dublin, or the idea was originally arrived at here in Dublin at one of the tech conferences. And that was just an idea. And Uber has, you know, completely transformed an industry like globally, you know, and that to me, you know, is, is quite amazing. So I suppose, you know, the, the growth in content and its ability to change things and the way it's consumed, you know, really are the, the things that, have, that really strike me, if you're asking me, you know, over the, the last 10, 20 years. So, so you mentioned Uber there. So technology, I mean, Vistatech is also known for being very strong in the kind of enterprise tech mm -hmm. localization space. So what's your approach to managing this Careful, this balance kind of between diversifying for growth, but also specializing in a particular niche. Like what's, what's yeah. the overall strategy of this? Um, well, I think, you know, I, diversification, when somebody says diversification to me, I always think, you know, that's a way of reducing your risk, you know, and that's certainly one way of looking at the, the technology point of view. Our view on technology is we don't develop it ourselves. We won't, it's not what we would consider um, part of our, our, our strategy. What we will do, we don't build, we will buy. We will look at, you know, any particular problem that may require a technical solution. And then we will try and figure out what's the best solution to that. We won't necessarily have, you know, a prepackaged solution that we've developed ourselves. So our attitude to technology um, is very agnostic. You know, we will buy um, our competitors' technology, no problem. If it's the best solution for the customer, I don't mind. Um, what we will do, though, or what we do try and do, and have done very successfully, is we will try and knit, you know, our bring together various pieces of technology. So our attitude to technology is look at the problem first, see how what's the best way to solve it, and what's the best piece of technology or kit to address that challenge, and then go with that. We wouldn't necessarily have a particular view on, you know, this is the right piece of technology, and we're going to try and sell it. And um, we we don't we don't we don't we don't work that way. 
as I said, we would see it being very much look at the problem first and what it is that you're trying to achieve and what's the best fit in terms of a solution thereafter. So, you know, that's that would be quite a, a very strongly held view um, within Vistatech. You know, we won't be um, reinventing the wheel. Maybe. I don't know if that answers your question. No. Yeah. I think, I think maybe as an adjacent yeah. question, I noticed Good. that Vistatech, I think, is well, it holds the ISO certification for post editing of machine translation, I think. And mm. I mean, I was a bit intrigued because yeah. I think relatively few, comparative to how many LSPs are out there at the moment, relatively few have actually adopted um, that ISO standard quite yet. So, I mean, what I just wanted to ask what business benefits yep. do you see in these kind of standards? Do you have a particular strategy for ISO? Um, you know, Obtaining things like medical yeah. devices, post-editing, okay. what do you see as the value that it adds? Well, okay, well, the med devices side of things is slightly, is is kind of a case and mm. are slightly different in that, you know, if you want to play in that space, you know, you've got to comply, you know, with the regulatory requirements that are there. And, you know, ISO would in some cases, whether it's regulatorily required or not, um, the, the customers would insist on it. Look, ISO regardless of, of of what context you're looking at it in you know to me is part of an approach to operational excellence right and it brings a level of discipline you know to your your operational execution and we look at iso and the various standards in not necessarily uh you know it's something that it's good to have because you know it helps you with rfps and that that's kind of one way of looking at it, but I think it's quite a narrow view and you don't really get a lot out of it. We're actually looking for something from ISO, from all of the standards. We, you know, we want to come away with something positive from them, not a kind of tick the box, we can do this because, you know, there are lots of industry experts out there. They know probably a lot, an awful lot more than we do. So it's in our interest to engage with them. So I would look at all those things, not necessarily as say from the point of view of tick box, we've got these, but what can we learn from them? And then what can we, you know, what can we, what, in some cases, you know, what can we say? No, that doesn't work for us. So the the certifications themselves, you know, they do. There is requirements for them, um, and and that's helpful. But the the process and the discipline of adhering to them, you know, does bring a lot of benefits to an organization, and particularly in terms, you know, in, in scalable organizations mm. like us. Yeah, it, it's an interest. It's an interesting one. I think a question that a lot of LSPs have. Yeah. Um, a follow on question then regarding machine translation. I think. You have a partnership with uh, Adapt Center, which is pretty local to where you are. What, what does that involve mm -hmm. uh, exactly? Do, yeah. Well, th that basically involves, you know, the tech team here in, in Dublin cooperating with them on various projects. And um, we would have um, our CTO, Phil Ritchie, would have uh, a very strong reputation uh, within within the industry and has been involved in various standard setting um, processes both at European level and at a local level. So I suppose it's it's more about trying to craft or bring our views, you know, in terms of where we'd like to see things going um, and our experience and the experience that we've gained from our customers with those various organizations. But again, um, our approach to MT isn't necessarily limited to one particular flavor or not. I'd say we've probably got most flavors um, available within within Vistatech. It very much depends on you know the outcomes that the clients are are, mm. are trying to achieve. Yeah, I mean, and thinking then about some of these requirements and what customers are trying to achieve. I mean, we've heard a lot about clients in technology and software thinking about things or wanting to achieve agile translation, localization, and get rid mm -hmm. of things like minimum fees. I mean, when you're thinking about these mm -hmm. clients in technology and in software, what do you think are their main pain points right now? Look, I think one of the biggest challenges, you know, at the moment is that concept of agility and speed of mm -hmm. execution. You know, we work in an industry, you know, that, that never sleeps, you know, that has extraordinarily demanding uh, consumers at, at the end of the at the end of the chain who are as i've said to some extent fickle so you know if you don't execute so the 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 idea of being able to service very quickly with a high quality product and you know to be switched on and off you know literally you know in the blink of an eye is is critical and that's that's you know where we come in that's the expertise and the experience that we bring to it and um, so you know 
it's it's incumbent upon us to be agile because if you're not well then you're not going to be able to service your your, your customers needs or objectives and um, so that idea of agility you know in some sense to me also you know correlates to scalability but speed being the key you know speed being the key with 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 you know with quality underpinning it all so, so I'm a big SaaS fan, and I, it's kind of my guilty pleasure to subscribe to God knows how many SaaS uh, tools, and some of them, many of them I use, some of them I don't. But yeah. localization of SaaS um, must have been a, a massive growth area over the past, you know, 10, 10 years, right? Since it started and, and an organization like Vistatech would have had to adapt to that. Like, what's your take on any particular yeah, I think challenges the, the, the... there? Not particularly, because the structures around how our how localization, you know, works, you know, fit most business models, be it, you know, kind of retail, you know, whatever. The, the way, you know, the financial structures and the financial approach to it remains the same. You know, there, the fact that, um, you know, it's, you know, SaaS versus non-SaaS doesn't necessarily um, impact how we would go about you know the business of of the projects um again you know it you know there was never a situation or certainly not one that i can recall where you know agreements with clients would have you know stuff like you know minimum volumes or whatever it was to one extent you know or another you know a SaaS model you know you had an agreement with the client and like it either you either did it or you didn't if you didn't do it you didn't do the work you didn't get paid so it was to some extent you know always you know a SaaS environment for us um and i think i think you're right i think it is going to it's 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 the way it's going and i, I don't see it going any other direction yeah we don't have we don't have anything else <laughs> we love SaaS. SaaS. i don't have a so moment, i think i have no. one piece of software yeah. I, I think you mentioned earlier something about uh translation being a rel well, relatively small but sort of conventional translation being about a third of of, of your revenues mm. um i mean you've got so you've got a number of other business yeah. lines as well and I, I think one of those is localization staffing mm. is that an important part of the business and I mean, what challenges and opportunities are there yeah, for yeah, LSPs? Yeah, that's the yeah, I saw yeah. that. It is okay. I would have to be very mm. upfront about this and say, you know, localization staffing solutions for us, right? For VistaTech, we would see them in the context of a wider client mm. relationship, right? We're not. You know that wouldn't be um, our core business, and that's not necessarily one that we sure. want to be in either. Um, but as part of a wider business relationship with the client, yeah, we do it all the time. Um, but it isn't what I would consider to be. You know, we wouldn't go and offer it as you know a standalone, mm -hmm. right? It is part of a wider relationship because, you know, that's that's an I suppose going back to you know VistaTech and what it's about you know long business and trusting relationships with the customers are absolutely vital to us that's how we survive and thrive you know um we don't we don't grow in terms of an m a um path that's not our gig and um, we grow by the quality of our service and the, the quality of the relationships and the longevity of the relationships we have with our clients so as part of that, there are, um, you know, uh, if you like, uh, staffing solutions put in place, but it wouldn't necessarily be, you know, one that we would offer separately. Yeah, if that yeah. Makes sense. no, it makes or, total sense. I think it's it's interesting to see it as an add-on, but also as an important part of servicing your customers as well. Yeah, you know, like it, if you're there trying to service, you know, somebody with a global presence and, you know, they come to you with a, mm. with a problem, like, uh, going back to the start of the conversation, you know, what is it that we do? We provide global content solutions, yeah. right? And part of that could be somebody rings up and says, look, we've got this problem, wherever it may be, what can you yeah. do for us? Well, we're there to solve. We're there to help. Yeah. So in, in that in that sense, yes, it does happen. It, it makes complete sense. And, and I'll just pick up on something you mentioned okay. there, which is um, not growing by M&A. Um, I mean, what's your attitude generally? It seems to be more yes. organically driven growth. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think we're probably the last um, independent uh, <laughs> localization company that hasn't bought somebody. Um, it's um, look, it's just you know, for an organization to be successful, it has to have 
you know certain beliefs and values and one of the beliefs that that we at VistaTech and the founders have you know is that we will grow on the basis of you know the excellence of our service we are not an m a house that's not our mm -hmm. gig um, and that's just a choice that we have made and you know we're pretty happy with it and um, i have absolutely um no uh nothing bad to say about the competition about the way they go about their business you know they're very successful um but it's just not the approach that we're going to take and um, mm -hmm. we've decided mm -hmm. that m a is for m a and we provide you know global content linguistic solutions and we're pretty good at it we think and pretty happy with that so again you know it's just it's it's one of our beliefs if you yeah. like so, so in 2020 counter to what i thought probably at the you know in the first quarter second quarter there was a there was a real m a boom uh, mm. and not to go back to uh, the m a topic but to 2020 i mean how, how has it been for you transitioning through this kind of unprecedented situation with staff with office yep. with clients okay well let's start with Let's start with one of the more important ones or the most important one, staff. Huge concern for us, um, you know, to try and keep staff safe and well um, physically and let's be frank about it mentally. Like that's a huge concern. You know, I would certainly um, have to say that, you know, having to work from home in the, in, 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 over the last year hasn't been, you know, the highlight of my career. Um, so from that point of view, you know, we have to be very conscious of that. From a business perspective, some clients have done very well. Some clients have not done well. You know, but overall, we've 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 um, more than held our own. We've had a, we had a very good year, and we were growing, which I suppose is always always a good thing. Um, but look, it has definitely been challenging. You know, moving your entire operation offsite in the space of two days. Anyone that says you know that that's easy, I wouldn't believe them. Um, but it went very successfully for us, and ninety nine percent of it is down to the people that work for us. They were fantastic, like totally cooperative. Um, and totally accepting of you know the situation that we found ourselves in, and we just got on with it. So all credit to the team, you know, nothing, very little to do with me. From the client side, some clients had it very tough. You know, some businesses saw things, the taps just turn off, like airlines, travel, and so on. Like we all we all know who they are. Um, some of the retail businesses didn't do so well. Those with a strong online presence, um, boomed. Those without an online presence got one very quickly. So. You know, we kind of came in there on the back of that, but no, it, it overall I have to say we we did we did well. I'm very happy and um, with how the team performed. Mm. Very happy. When it comes to marketing strategies, I mean, Vista Tech seems to be quite active generally with blogs, thought leadership, the Think Global Forum. Mm. Has has COVID changed any of that at all? And, and what kind of marketing are you involved in at the moment? Well, okay. Well, the first thing I have to say is I'm from a finance background, so I'm involved in no <laughs> marketing. Right. And that's 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 a strategic decision by mm -hmm. my fellow directors because I really haven't a clue. No, <laughs> look, we have, we do have a very active um, marketing department, and um, they are uh, out there and doing some great stuff for us. My take on marketing is, you know, what we want to do is what we want out there. We want people to understand what we stand mm -hmm. for, right? What it is that what our values are, what we're trying to achieve, and the type of people and the type of organization that we want to be. And to me, all of the marketing that we do, be it the Think Global Forums, the blogs, you know, the, the VTQs, whatever, that is all about um, positioning ourselves where we want to be out there and getting people to know and to understand the type of organization that we are and what it is that we're trying to achieve and how we can help them. And um, so, you know, we do, Simon and the team, you know, do a huge amount of, of excellent stuff there and they are very active on it. But as I say, they keep me well out of it. <laughs> There you go. Well, they, I, I don't think they keep you out of the strategy planning. So, A, what's well, your so. kind of two to three outlook for the language industry? And then, like, what are some of the bigger, exciting initiatives, projects for VistaTech in the next, you know, 12 to 18 months? Okay. So, your your side so, and then the broader so picture. Outlook for the for the industry, continued growth. You know, like, I'd be a fool to say otherwise. You know, every year, you know, we think, you know, Forrester or somebody does a survey and says, you know, it's X billion or whatever, and then the following year, sure, it's blown out of the water. So continued growth um, would certainly be one for me. I think the the content is certainly, you know, um, video is, is huge. You know, it's going to, you know, that's just, 
going to continue in my mind. And um, so, you know, that's going to be a, a crucial part of it. Um, in terms of what would I be looking forward to a little bit more closer to home? Um, I think it will be one of the things I am actually looking forward to is seeing the clients that we have worked with over many, many years that took a serious hit in COVID. I'm really looking forward to seeing those guys getting back on their feet. I thought it would just be great. Mm. We've worked with guys, you know, for 10, 15 years and they took a serious hammering. And hopefully, you know, in the next month or two, we will see them get back on their feet. And I am really looking forward to that because, you know, it's been tough for them. Um, a little bit closer to home again for me. Um, I'd be very curious to see what the office of the future for Vistatech looks like. You know, I'd be very curious to see how that pans out. You know, um, I think we've all enjoyed some aspects of, you know, working from home. And, you know, but we wouldn't mind going back to the office too. I don't know how that's going to play out, but we have to be open to um, all the variants that, that, that were out there that perhaps before we thought, you know, God, you can't do that. But we've certainly learned, you know, it's amazing what you can do when you put your mind to it and somebody puts a gun to your head. So, you know, those things, I suppose, will be the things that I'll be watching most closely. Great, Thomas. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. And personally, I'm looking forward to well traveling at some point when it's safe again. And uh, maybe we can meet sometime Indeed. in Dublin. Thanks, Thomas. Point. All right. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.